Hello, everybody, and welcome to the six-round post-fight show for USC Rio Rancho. I will be filling in for Zane Simon. I'm Andy Mercado. Zane, of course, is back to Remulac to Norfolk the Garthok, as he does from time to time. But um, taking my place, I guess. I guess you're filling in for me? Yes, is sir. That, is, that, is that what we're doing here? So, Dane Fox, uh, always love when you join. Love your input. Uh, thank you for being here, and wow, what a strong finish to an otherwise kind of lackluster and wonky card full of illegal knee disqualifications and meaningless fights, I guess I'll say. That's a good way to put it. Uh, I, I felt like it had a, a hint of professional wrestling to it, you know, like Diego Sanchez turned heel, he, he took the heel's way out to get the win, you know, but... Uh, like you said, uh, the main event absolutely delivered what we were all hoping for. Um, uh, Jan uh, Blahovich delivering a brutal knockout on Corey Anderson and just creating all sorts of confusion at the top of the light heavyweight division. Uh, I don't think it creates too much confusion. I think it's best case scenario. Uh, had this been a stinker and like a, a really lame decision manifested then we would be like well where does john jones go from here and we would be the same question we had after the reyes fight so at least in this situation we can be like okay uh jan is is clearly finishing people now he just did that to Corey anderson you know he's won seven of his last eight like why not put him in there like if an immediate rematch isn't going to happen with dominic reyes let john jones fight jan and he seems up for it new a new competitor new challenge different style like why not i'm i'm 100 with you on that eddie i i think that jan has done everything in, within his power to uh pick up the title shot he uh let's see before this he defeated jacare souza uh, a former strike force champion before that he uh, and a middle, knocked out a middleweight let's yes be but he, he he was fighting at a at 205, you know, um, uh, he knocked out Luke Rockhold, a uh, former UFC middleweight champion. Uh, middleweight. Either way, <laughs> he's he's putting him out, you know, like uh, his last four victories have all come. Um, no, 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 no. This, that's I, I lied about that because Jacare was a terrible decision. But, you know, for the most part, uh, Blahovich is also, delivering. It was also a terrible fight. Oh, yeah. That, I, that's why I was just kind of moving on from it, because the less said about it, the better. Facts. <laughs> Big facts. But, you know, that's what, seven of his last eight appearances that he's won? Um, four of them have uh, been finishes. Um, you know, a, a mixture of submissions and, and knockouts. He's he's looked good. You know, he's patched uh, the uh, defensive wrestling that was plaguing him up to that point. And I, I can't say that I would uh, be unexcited to see him face off against Jones. But would you pick him to beat Jones? I didn't pick I didn't pick Reyes to beat him, but I thought he did by the time that was over. So I Very true. <sighs> My so only I, concern I, there is just how slow Jan is on his feet, and like how how you can just back him up. And I feel like. It's kind of a bad stylistic matchup for him. Nonetheless, though, I'm definitely happy if he does get it. You know, I feel like he's earned it. And by putting Corey Anderson out, like the way he did, just a, a beautiful counter right hand. And then that follow up hammer fist, which was like almost not necessary, but it still kind of was because the ref was like, well, he's still kind of there and he's got one hand up kind of doing something. So like he did what he had to do. And it was every bit of brutal. Yep. And so it's, it's like why we why we watch this sport. What's even crazier about this win for Blahovich is uh, within those seven wins, two of them were rematches, and they were losses he avenged, including this one over Anderson. Oh, wow. That's uh, the a, that's the other one was uh, uh, Jimmy Manoa. Mm. I think, uh, man, I'm, I'm really proud that Jan showed up the way he did. Um, and Anderson, man, I think... I, like he went for a couple level changes and he, he kind of tried to get the takedown and tried to get the fight in the clinch, but not really. He just seemed super content to to work his boxing and strike. And I think he definitely took away a lot of confidence from uh, knocking out Johnny Walker. Yeah. But I think Jan's just a different animal and a lot more seasoned with strikes. So, man, I don't know. I guess we'll see. 
I think John Jones is down. Jan's obviously calling for it. I think it was a good move. He walked right over to the champ after he won and, and just started pleading his case. And, you know, he, he even said, Hey, you told me you'd give me this. Let's do it. But you know what? In the meantime, it, it almost sets up uh, um, Reyes to have a contest with Santos because, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that Santos beat. Uh, Jones, Tiago Santos, to clarify, but yeah, I you can't deny that 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 fight wouldn't be bonkers either. Reyes, Reyes, and Santos. I love that fight, and it yeah. makes sense. And that could be a number one contenders fight since yeah, exactly. both of them are, are, you know, quite deserving of rematches. I would say, or they they at least showed their worth in their fights. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think John Jones beat Santos personally. I thought Reyes beat John Jones, and I can't believe I just said that, but. <laughs> It's uh, it is what it is, but I, I think it, it definitely just makes the division more exciting. Yeah, because it, it kind of, I, I think you made a great point with having the the guys who just lost to John Jones fight it out since, and then maybe they'll get another shot after that. Yeah, I, I yeah. like that a lot. You know, and given that uh, Gustafson never, it, it well, I shouldn't say never, but it took years until he finally got the rematch with Jones. You know, I'm sure that they're going to do the same thing with Reyes. You know, Santos was injured anyway, so you know, I think that's probably how it's going to play out. It, it it makes too much sense for that not to happen, if you ask me. Yeah, but I, I, it was a definitely a nice and much needed exclamation point on this entire card. Like we said, a bunch of wonkiness, and let's get right into that. So the yes. co-main event, Diego Sanchez defeats Michelle Pereja by disqualification due to an illegal knee. And man, this fight, it was definitely a weird one, but all of Pereja's fights are. Um, but what surprised me is how composed Michelle was throughout. Like he was a lot more. He was he fought a lot more like a regular, traditional mixed martial artist. You know he was he was just bringing pressure and throwing his cross. But then he did sneak in some flashy stuff like you know Superman punches off the cage and Showtime yep. kicks and backflips on a downed opponent, which I'm pretty <laughs> sure is illegal. Like you can't do that, right? <laughs> I, I I would think that it's a, a type of a stomp or I don't know. It doesn't necessarily qualify as a stomp, uh, as a soccer kick, but it, aren't stomps illegal? That's what I was saying. I think that it's a stomp. I know it's not a soccer kick and I don't know. You can you, soccer you, kick the body. Yes, that's what I was going to say. You can do that into the body, but I mean He's got probably just as much chance as landing on their face as he does their body. I have no clue how to or, the, or right on the the nads. You know what uh, I yeah. mean? Like, that's yeah. what I'm afraid of. <laughs> but he he really found a way to lose this because he was in control the entire time. Sanchez was constantly backing up, and when Sanchez wasn't, he was like sprinting forward trying to land a flurry just to get clocked again. And the in the third round, uh, M- Michel has Sanchez all sorts of hurt. He throws a ton of knees. And Sanchez kind of crumbles to the canvas. And then for no good reason at all, Michelle just throws this knee to the face that definitely connected, definitely caused damage. The referee stops the action, brings in the doctor. The doctor's like, oh, he's good. But Sanchez was like, well, is that a disqualification if if uh, if I can't continue? And Jason Herzog, the referee, is like, ah, just let me know if you can continue or not. You know what I mean? And so Sanchez was like, no, I, uh, I can't see – it was an illegal knee, and so the referee waved it off, and Sanchez uh, pulled out an old salty dog veteran move there and, and got himself a uh, a much-needed win. And, you know, people can be like, oh, Diego took the easy way out, and, you know, that's not uh, respectable. But, like, the dude got kneed in the face by Michelle Pereja on the ground. Like, that sucks. Like, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. You know, like, it's... I understand. Oh, Could he have continued? Probably. But we 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 really don't know how much he was hurt. And so I, I'm not going to I'm not going to give him too much flag for that because I, I I honestly wouldn't want anyone to have to eat that kind of knee. I'm not going to give him any flack for that. I you know, I I think okay, if I was in his shoes what would I do? And you think about this logically, I'm lo- he's losing this fight, you know, for 13 minutes. He's been getting his ass whooped, and he has shown little ability to be able to finish Pejera. So he's got two minutes to finish him off. Doesn't look like it's going to happen. Or he's just got a need in the head, 
he can be done. You know, that means he doesn't have to potentially go get his ass kicked for another two minutes. And he can not only be done with it, he can collect a win bonus as well. Yes, that's I an excellent would point. One hundred percent, do that if I was him, and anybody else who says otherwise that they wouldn't, I think, is lying to themselves. Yeah, I think you know, like just the the people who crave blood and just want carnage and don't honestly care about the fighters. I'm sure they're like, oh, boo. Yeah, but like. I love Diego Sanchez. He deserves all the money. So, like you said, him getting a win bonus, I think that's a that's a win all around. And, and he has taken enough beatings over the years I, as it is. For anybody absolutely. to say that he's not a warrior, they can go to hell. Sanchez, he did he deserves a break here. And another reason I I am okay with this outcome is because I believe it's going to teach Michelle a lesson. Because if you looked from his last fight. Um, with Tristan Connolly, he lost that decision. So what happens? He comes out in his next ma- match, and he's way more composed and and looks, you know, using a lot more fundamentals to try and win the fight. And so I think he's only going to learn from this, and it will improve his overall game because, you know, you can't you have to follow the rules. Personally, yep. I think knees to a grounded opponent should be one hundred percent legal. Like I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. That's that was one of my favorite things about Pride when they were around. Is you could soccer kick and you can knee guys on the ground. And I think we wouldn't get as many decisions as we did, or as we do. And it, it just it's more it's more realistic, you know. Yeah. Like I think that kind of needs needs to be revisited. And it's it's kind of a shame that it's not just like the twelve to six elbow. Like come on. I, no, I'm 100% with you on that. Yeah, I I think that the uh, knees to a downed opponent's a, a dumb rule as well. We've seen fighters play chicken with that uh, so many times. And it, it, like you said, it, it takes away a lot of the realism to it. I, I understand why they put it in. Um, Gan McGee back in the day is a big reason why that happened. Um, oh, they're brutal. They're yeah. absolutely brutal. Yeah, but you know what? So is so is what Jan did to Corey Anderson tonight. Exactly, and that, that's what I was going to say. This, this is a sport about uh, brutality. Uh, the guys who step into the cage are well aware of what they're getting into, and and if they're not, they're they're usually done with the sport pretty damn fast. So, I bet we see a lot less people pulling guard than we do already. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it would completely change the game. It would be a game changer, one hundred percent. Yeah, but you know, I mean, not not much else needs to be said on that. Um, you know, at this point, uh, Sanchez is just an, an institution. He's going to have a job at the UFC as long as Dana White can pull that off, and his UFC career c- you know, continues. It's, you know, it's <laughs> funny. Sanchez has now won three of his last four. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, uh, anyway, so let's let's go go ahead on moving on. So women's flyweight division, Montana De La Rosa took a unanimous decision over over Mara Borella. Borella? It's Borella. Mara Romero Borella. Yeah, I, I have issues with her name too. <laughs> it was a pretty close first round. I think Borella might have edged it out with the strikes. Um, but DLR comes back in the second round and completely owns the grappling. Mm-hmm. Like totally. Like I think she had the back for almost three minutes or something crazy like that. Yeah. Like she was completely dom- dominant credit to Barella for surviving all those rear naked choke attempts, but she got owned there. And then in the third round, Montana lands a beautiful right hand that drops Barella taking the fight right back to the ground. And DLR was able to ride the rest of the round out and pick up a strong unanimous decision and she made history by being the first husband and wife duo to uh, compete on a UFC card. So that's kind of cool, too. Yes. yes. And very I was little, noteworthy. Very cool. <laughs> I was a little concerned because Mark De La Rosa, he lost his fight. He was the, the card opener. And I, I wondered if that, like, does anything to Montana or, like, affects her or whatever. But she came out and got the win. So. And you know what? All idea. the more credit to Mark for that as well, because when when a fighter suffers a knockout loss, that that can be devastating. You know, nobody wants to have their lights turned out and how much work they put into these events or these fights, I should say. And then after Montana uh, takes the decision, 
Mark's over there smiling in the corner, as beaming as happy as can be. Guy's a stud, in my opinion. You know, he he personally he had a bad night. He got knocked out. Didn't matter. He was there supporting his wife, giving her all the credit in the world. Thumbs up to him for that. Yeah, big ups to him and credit to Montana for getting the win and yep. moving up in the flyweight division. She came in ranked. Uh, what was she at? She I was like number. She was thirteen or twelve. Yeah, one number of them twelve, was 12 coming one of them was 13. in. So uh, I don't know. Maybe she can fight the winner of An- Antonina Shevchenko and uh, who is she fighting? Uh, Cynthia Calvillo. They're about yep. to get it on in April. So maybe she'll fight the winner of that and uh, try to keep moving up the ranks. Yeah. Um, you know, it, one of the things that's easy to forget with De La Rosa, because she's been around for a while. Like, she lost to Mackenzie Dern a few years ago, mm-hmm. but she just barely turned 25. So she's she's still got quite a bit of time before she hits her physical peak. So Definitely still growing. Definitely mm-hmm. known for her grappling. So it was really great to see her land a, a punch that dropped somebody in a fight. Yep. That was really good to see. All right, let's get back to this uh, illegal knee situation. So <laughs> before yeah. that, Brock Weaver wins his UFC debut by disqualification because Rodrigo Vargas – or is it Rodrigo? I think it's Rodrigo. Uh, I'm just calling him Kazula. <laughs> <laughs> so Vargas, he gets a takedown. He's doing well. He fights off the guillotine attempt. And then for some reason – decides, oh, I'm going to throw a knee to my grounded opponent. And so he does, and it looked like Weaver kind of went out on uh, on impact, and the referee, credit to the referees for being on top of the action tonight too. So the referee yes. steps in, uh, automatically is like, no, he went out, this is over. Weaver gets the win. Uh, tough break for Vargas. It, you know, You have to control your weapons. You have to follow the rules. This is a sport. I think it's a stupid rule, but it's it's just kind of the way things are. So tough break for Vargas. And uh, Weaver was a super good sport about it, which I'm not surprised. Uh, his character is just – it's so much fun for me. He's electric when he talks, and uh, I'm glad he's in the UFC. I'm not sure he fights as well as he can talk or hype people up. Yeah. But, man, he's got great hair and a great headdress. So, you know, maybe they'll run that back. I think Weaver said he would give him a rematch. But, like, if you get disqualified, I don't think you should get a rematch. I'm I'm with you on that one. Um, like you said, it's it's the same deal with Pajera. And Pajera, it, the fact that this one happened, what, about an hour before makes Pajera's illegal knee that much more egregious. But, uh, yeah. They know the rules. Uh, if if they don't, then I don't know where they've been. And uh, Vargas wasn't even arguing. He he knew as soon as it happened what he had done. Um, Weaver, there's absolutely no doubt that he got knocked out in the process. Uh, when he sat up and he was talking to the referee, he was asking what happened. He had no clue. So there, there was no logical way that he could continue. Um, unfortunate uh for vargas because he looked he looked good i mean i don't know anybody that had picked vargas to win it you know weaver was a fairly heavy favorite but vargas was, i thought vargas was the favorite no i i thought weaver was oh uh, let's take a look at that real quick then yes, let's we get can. to the bottom of this <laughs> uh so uh let's see weaver was Oh, no, you're right. Weaver was a minus 230 favorite. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, someone cashed in on – or no, no. The underdog did not cash in on that. Nope, not in this case. All right. So, yeah, knees to a grounded opponent should be illegal, but they're not. And if you don't follow the rules, you get disqualified. <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. All right. So let's talk about missing weight. Oh. <laughs> no one who follows the rules. Am I the only one that gives a crap about the rules here? It seems like it. (laughs) So Ray Borg missed weight for the fourth time in his UFC career and didn't have a good excuse. He just – that's just who he is as a person. (laughs) And uh, But, you know, he showed up to fight and absolutely owned the wrestling for three rounds. I think um, Rogerio had maybe – 
maybe like a minute and some change of actual clinch control up against the cage. Mm -hmm. But then it was as if Borg just flipped a switch and was like, okay, now we're going to grapple for real. And yeah, Hagerio just could not get Borg off of him. Like it was just takedown after takedown, control. Uh, I think there was a, a backpack situation for a long time where Borg took the back standing, had a body triangle on. Yep. And this was pretty much one way traffic here. Yeah. And what's crazy is so, uh, but Bontorin, how do you say that? Bontorin? Bontorin? Uh, I, I've been hearing Bontorin, but. Bontorin, that sounds right. Well, he was ranked coming in. Yes. And obviously, Ray Borg was not. But coming in ranked number seven in a shallow division, granted, that is flyweight. But if you beat a ranked opponent and you can't make weight, should you be ranked? I would say no. Uh, and the reason why Borg had not officially been ranked is his last two fights had been at bantamweight because, you know, the UFC had been indicating they were getting rid of flyweight. So he was trying to jump ahead of that. But uh, I'm with you. I don't think he should be ranked. Um I don't even know if he should get another chance to to fight at flyweight again. I mean, well, he, it, it, he missed weight at bantamweight too. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> even more egregious is that he didn't make weight at bantamweight. Now, the the one that he missed at bantamweight, I know that he was um, you know, coming off of a lot of medical issues with his with his kid. Mm -hmm. um, thank goodness that that has uh, turned out to be as positive as it has at this point. Uh, but you know, this time around to, to Borg's credit, he did say that he didn't have a good excuse. You know, he could have made one up easy enough and we probably would have taken him at his word for it, regardless of whether it was good or not. But three times you miss weight, dude. Four. I, it's four. Yeah. Well, three times at flyweight and then, yeah, the, uh, it's yeah, even yeah, worse. Yeah. The fact that he's made it at, at missed at Bantam weight. You're right there. Like it clearly shows that he needs someone to take him by the hand and show him how to properly cut weight and yep. hold him to that and hold him accountable for it because this is the elite level. It's just unprofessional. Yep. Yep. And it, it kind of put a, puts a little damper on how impressive his win was when, oh, when you're able like a million bucks. When when you're able to out grapple flyweights who are so scrappy and hard to hold down, like that impresses me beyond belief. Yeah. That's so hard to do. So it, it kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. But credit to him, two fight winning streak. Maybe he'll get ranked. Maybe he won't. But whatever. He probably will. But you know, like I said, I 100 percent agree with you. I don't think he should be eligible for that because he has not fought an actual fight at the flyweight flyweight class since he got manhandled by uh, Mighty Mouse. Yeah, the mouse trap. Oh, that was beautiful. Yep. All right. So opening up the UFC Rio Rancho main card, Lon Lando Venata took a unanimous decision over Yancey Medeiros in a fight that I did not expect to go the way that it went. Oh, my goodness. Was this just not fun? No, it was not at all. I really expected them to just go toe to toe and, and just really get into a war. But Venata came out and used his footwork just really exceptionally well and his Use beautiful entries and head movement, and Yancey just couldn't find a way to really connect until like the very end of the fight. And Venata, he was sneaking shots in, but he wasn't going crazy with it. He was super reserved. Um, I, I think it's a phenomenal fighting style that Venata uses, and I really like the way he switches stances and finds his entries, and he's super fluid out there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. this it wasn't exactly fan-friendly, fan even though he did land that sweet spinning back kick to the face. As a fan, th there there wasn't a lot to like about this. But as a coach, particularly as Venata's coach, you loved what he did in there. Yeah. Um, the the footwork was functional because it, it used to be that he had a, he's always had a lot of movement. But mm -hmm. it, it wasn't always functional movement. This movement was totally functional. He he did a fantastic job of mixing up his strikes. Uh, you know, lots of low kicks. Uh, he he went to Madero's body a lot. Um, just he hit him up everywhere, and just left Madero swinging at air time after time. And yeah. th I mean, the, the announcers were trying to make it sound closer than what it was, but it was clear that Venado was winning every single round. 
Yeah, uh, a lot of variety. And I think maybe this is a turning point for him where he's able to start winning fights and yep. coming up with some consistency. Because if you look at his track record, I mean, it's such a mixed bag. Win, loss, win, draw, loss, draw, loss, win, loss, win. Like it's really – like his entire UFC career has been plagued with inconsistency. So if he can keep coming up with with performances like this and, and remain in enigma – and hard to figure out, then he's got he's got a really good chance of stringing some wins together. So great from a technical standpoint, but in terms of just you know blood sport action, not <laughs> not not the fight we thought we were going to get. No, not at all. All right, so closing out the prelims, uh, a crazy upset here. UFC newcomer Daniel Rodriguez. Caught a standing guillotine on the dirty bird, Tim Means. And man, this was nuts. Means comes out like a veteran and just starts putting on Rodriguez with a little bit of variety, some volume. Gets a quick takedown. But then Rodriguez gets back to his feet. Means keeps bringing the pressure, coming forward. And then at the very end of the first round, just as the bell sounds, Rodriguez lands this left hand that drops Mean. And it was legal. It was on time. It wasn't yes, late. It was. And Means goes stumbling back to his stool, but he recovered in time to come out for the second round. But that gave Rodriguez all the confidence in the world. It let him know that he belongs there. And Means just wasn't the same. Yeah, it was. No. It was just one way traffic. Then everything that. Rodriguez was throwing was hurting Means, and. Uh, he was really putting it on him and actually forced Means to take a bad shot, like a, a survival takedown. And then Rodriguez locked up a beautiful guillotine on the feet and got the tap. It it wasn't your classic club and sub by any means, but he he had knocked Means silly with so many of those punches that mm -hmm. that uh, desperation takedown you were mentioning is it was completely set up by Rodriguez just knocking him silly. And it's it, like it's, a Nate Diaz kind of thing. Yes, yes, and, and it's kind of weird because we we've seen Means in the UFC for the for the better part of the last eight or nine years at this point, and he's always just been a a model of durability. But when when you've been fighting at a high level for for so long, the the miles start to pile up, and you you just can't take it the way that you used to. And it looks like that we've we've hit that point with Means. He just he can't take the punishment the way he, he did in the past. Yeah. And Rodriguez it looks like he hits really freaking hard. Yes. Yeah. And credit to him. He won a performance bonus tonight. Well deserved. So your first UFC fight, you're winning a performance bonus. I absolutely love that because I'm sure he wasn't making a ton of cash before he made it here. And he's still not, I'm, I'm sure he's not making buku bucks for this fight itself. So, you know, yeah. from going, from you know, contender series, Combate America events, Smash Global Nine, <laughs> to uh, just completely hurting Tim Means and choking him out on UFC on ESPN plus twenty five. You know that's that's pretty freaking impressive. Mm -hmm. And now he's got some some money in his pocket, so he can, you know, pay for training and and hopefully invest that into his training camp and his fighting career. Yeah, pay some at, bills or whatever he's got going on. Yeah, and he's he's already thirty three, so it's not like he's one of those young up and coming prospects. So if he's gonna he's gonna if he's gonna make noise, he's gonna have to do it in a hurry. So this will be a big help towards that. Yeah, and what a way to make a statement. Yep. Uh, other performance of the night went to uh, Blahovic again. That was well deserved. Absolutely. And. Um, it, Scott it kinda, Holtzman, Scott Holtzman, and Jim Miller. Yep, I was gonna say, kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fight before that, though, before we jump to Holtzman and Miller, uh, did you see uh, uh, John Dodson's first knockout in four years coming? <laughs> uh, I definitely didn't, but uh, good for him. And I, it was really a TKO, and it was kind sure. of a bad stoppage, but kind of a good stoppage at the same time. Um, it was. So Wood just comes blitzing out in the third round all crazy, and Dodson just lands this slick counter that drops Wood and, and then pounces. And mm -hmm. Dodson is so explosive and fast that he threw like 30 strikes in four seconds, just <laughs> this machine gun bump, ground strikes, 
and Wood didn't do anything to stop it. He just kind of sat there and ate him. And people are like, oh, well, that's a bad stoppage. Well, it's like, well, yeah, kind of. Like Wood probably could have just absorbed all of those and got back to his feet. But at the same time, that's not intelligently defending yourself. Yeah. Like taking uh, punches to the face is not intelligent defense. I don't care what anybody says. The My initial reaction to watching it was that it was a bad stoppage. As I watched the replay, though, uh, Wood didn't pop up to his feet until the referee had torn Dodson off of his back. So I, once I recognized that, yeah, I was po- totally fine with the stoppage. Um, part of the, I think the big key with Dodson though was he actually looked like he was kind of having fun in there. Last He's always kind of having fun in there though. Uh, last couple of fights, it seemed more like it was a job. Like he. Who was it that he had lost? Was it uh, Jan that he had lost to previously? Piotr Jan? Oh, well, uh, that's not fun ever. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, it, yeah, he just he didn't have the, the exuberance that he had, uh, usually showed when he uh, was in the cage or that it seemed forced. This time it seemed like he actually wanted to be there, that he, w- he was going to have some fun, that he was going to do his deal. And he, he went out and he totally did. Um, that could be because which- he's in front of a home crowd. And, and yeah, and I was going to say, I think part of the fact is that he is in New Mexico, which is where he's been. Yeah, I think that is where he's from, too. Yeah, he's a Jackson Wink guy. Yeah, he was born in New Mexico. OK, yeah. A, a lot of those guys end up migrating there. But now nah, he's born and raised in New Mexico, which makes it even more awesome for him. But yeah, um, the thing and with regards to Wood, he shouldn't be too discouraged because uh, he he, you know, he very well may have been winning that fight. I had him winning round one. I had Dodson winning round two, mm-hmm. but you know, Wood was right there competing with Dodson. Um, he he was uh, the more strategic puncher, you know, like using his length, and he caught Dodson a number of times. Like I think he was winning the overall striking uh, battle up until the point when uh, Dodson floored him because Dodson scored a bunch of rapid punches that counted as significant strikes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> up to that point i think that wood was winning the overall striking battle so um, dotson dotson really only loses to really elite competition like mm-hmm. if you look at his resume it's like wow you fought some really really great competition in your day probably the craziest thing about dotson he's been a professional since 2004 he has never been finished really really wow Super resilient. Mm. And you see what Peter Jan's doing now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, I mean, uh, Dodson went to a split decision with Marlon Marais, too. Uh, a yeah, that's insane. Ago. And John Lineker. Mm-hmm. Both splits. And with the distance with Demetrius Johnson twice. Yeah. And he's like... He's weird. He's like that bar. Like, if you, if you can beat Dodson, you're elite. And if you can't, then, you know, you got some work to do. Well, if we... You know, to be honest, you, he's probably a top two or three flyweight of all time. <laughs> you know, I mean, mm. Benavidez would be the other one besides Mighty Mouse. Benavidez. That you would say up in there. Mm. I mean, uh, so maybe Cejudo at this point, but, you know, I, I can't believe I forgot about him considering he is the one who beat Mighty Mouse. But, you know, Dodson's an all-time great at flyweight. Yeah, I guess that's fair. <laughs> uh, so part of me just doesn't want to agree with you but like i i don't think i can dispute that no i i get it it doesn't feel right but given that the division is uh so young with any meaningful history it it's hard to deny yeah he definitely has a lot a lot of longevity mm-hmm. on his side all right enough about dotson on to the fight of the night. <laughs> yeah, let's get on to the – my. I mean, I, I was amped for this going in. I thought it was going to be fight of the night. Uh, Scott Holtzman takes a unanimous decision over Jim Miller, and this was epic. They pretty much just banged this out for the bulk of the fight. Uh, I think Miller got ahead early. You know, he was landing some really slick left hands, counter left hands, which is yep. his dominant side. He's a southpaw. Holtzman came out uh, very intelligent, I think. He, he came out with forward pressure and a lot of feints. He wasn't really letting his hands go, but just a lot of feints. Whiffed on a couple of right hands, but I feel like it really helped him get his timing. And as the fight went on, 
he started to uh, throw with less power, more combinations, and started hitting his mark over and over again. Mm-hmm. And this was fun. By the end of it, both men were busted up, bleeding. And uh, it was good to see Holtzman uh, get that takedown and, uh, you know, not get submitted or swept or anything like that. You know, he was able to uh, land. He, he got caught in rubber guard for a second, but got out of that, stood up and dropped a big hammer on the Miller on the ground. And this was fun. I actually spoke to Holtzman before this, and I, I asked him if he was comfortable enough with his grappling to to tangle with Miller on the ground. And he was like, yeah, you know, mine's just as good as any anybody's. I'm a black belt myself. I hang with black belts. And uh, sure enough, you know, he did his thing here. So good good on Holtzman and good on Miller for winning performance bonuses here. Definitely yeah. fight of the night. Oh, easily. Uh, Miller came out strong, uh, was landing some heavy shots on Holtzman. Uh, Holtz, like you said, Holtzman found his uh, groove. And by the final round, I, <laughs> both of them were tired by the final round, so neither one of them were, were putting forth any sort of meaningful defense. <laughs> but, hey, it, it sure made it a, a lot of fun for us to watch. Um, credit to Holtzman for getting the win. I think he absolutely deserved it, but credit to, to Miller, you know, for being an OG and, you know, uh, tying uh, Donald Cerrone for mer- most performances in a cage and that's getting awesome. a performance bonus after 34 UFC fights. That's that's incredible. Yeah, he is an OG. But for Holtzman, he's on a little bit of a streak now. Yep. He, he's, uh, what is that, five of his last six? Uh, yeah, it wasn't it. Um, yeah, Nick Lentz was the lone loss. So yeah, five of his last six. Uh, so I asked one. Holtzman, I was like, Hey, so, you know, getting past Jim Miller, that's a, a huge feather in your, in, in your cap. So would you want someone close to the rankings or their dream fights or what? You know, he said, he was like, man, I'm coming for that BMF belt. <laughs> 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 like the dude just likes to come out and bang. And I totally respect that. It's so much fun to watch. So, fun fact that I uh, noticed when I was doing research for this fight. How much older than Holtzman do you think Miller is? I don't think it – they're the same age, aren't they? Miller is older than Holtzman by one month, which is really weird to think because we think of Miller as this old guy and Holtzman as still up and coming. So, I I just found that hilarious considering there's just a month separating them. Yeah, uh, Holtzman, uh, he had a a minor hockey – career yep. going on there for a little bit before leaving that and, and really going into martial arts. So he's kind of new to the game and he says he sees himself as an up and comer still, uh, which is pretty cool. So he doesn't have all the, the wear and tear of guys who have been fighting and competing and in wars and gym wars sparring all the time. So that's definitely a plus for him. And yep. uh, this was a fight with uh, a new camp. He left the MMA lab to be with his family and so it's good to see him change camps and still come up with a good win. Yeah. All right. So moving on down the line, we have Devin Clark taking a unanimous decision over Daquan Townsend, who we just saw get uh, out grappled for three rounds. And here we are again, watching him get out grappled for three rounds. Yeah, that. That uh, that may have been the worst fight on the card to watch, to be honest with you. And I, I was ready to crap all over Clark for a disappointing performance. I mean, it was a winning performance, but given that his opponent is extremely undersized for 205 and taking the contest on short bout, I had higher expectations. But after the fight uh, during an interview, he, he revealed he uh, believes he broke his foot early in the first round. Mm. And uh, so I, I can see where he would lose some of his explosion and not look so good. So uh, he gets uh, some leeway in my book for for that uh, due to the injury. But, you know, does what he needs to do, get the job done and uh, get back to winning ways. You know what would have made this fight end a lot sooner? What's up? Knees to the head of a grounded opponent. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though? Like he was in side control. Like he could have had this thing done. Like this yeah. could have been, this could have, he could have got a performance bonus, you know, like, come on, yeah. let's change this rule. I mean, Hey, it ended two other fights for the night. So, <laughs> uh, well, Diego probably would have kept fighting had that been, the, well, no, he probably would have just kept getting need in the face, honestly. Yeah. Either way, let's stop talking about this fight. <laughs> 
So before that, Mirab Divashvili took a unanimous decision over Casey Kenny, and I think he scored like 11 takedowns in this fight or something bananas like that. Mirab just absolutely got his grind on after – it was 12. That's it was insane. 12. 11 was his previous record. It was 12 that he scored in this one. Man, talk about rinse and repeat. Like yeah. Kenny's, Kenny came out strong and backing up Divishvili, but it's almost like Borg did. He flipped a switch and was like, okay, it's time to grapple. And and once, once Mirab started coming forward, it was pretty much Kenny was just holding on. And, and credit to him for getting up repeatedly. But I kind of feel like that's Mirab's game, you know, the rinse and repeat style where he wants you to use your energy to stand back up just so he can take you right back down. Mm -hmm. And at yeah. elevation, that's exhausting. No, that's that's exactly at what I was going to say. At sea level, that's exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, cre all the credit in the world to Devalish Vili on that one, because 12 takedowns in a fight is impressive on, on its own merit and accord. But to do so at elevation and and he didn't appear to be slowing down at all mm -hmm. towards the end either. Where, whereas Kenny, you know, cause N Kenny's been known to have a good gas tank, uh, himself, you know, he, he, uh, fought, it was, uh, Ray Borg. And who, who, who was his other win? Was it who Kenny? Manny Bermudez. That's it. He, he fought Ray Borg, Manny B Bermudez beat both of them, uh, you know, and it was by out scrapping both of them. He he could not get his feet underneath him with Dvalishvili. Dvalishvili just kept, kept coming at him, taking him down, rinse and repeat, like you said. And by the time the third round came or, came by, Kenny just – he had the look of a defeated man. Like he was still trying, but right. he just looked beyond frustrated. He definitely looked tired. Yeah. And yeah. Dvalishvili was using so many different takedowns also. Mm -hmm. Like he, he really put on a wrestling clinic tonight. Yeah. So good on him. All right, so let's move on. Before that, women's bantamweight bout Macy Chasson took a unanimous decision over Shanna Young. And this fight, that first round was absolutely crazy. Like, they didn't take a second to pause or anything. Young comes out hitting these head kicks that were landing. And Chasson was like, oh, no, grabs the tie clinch and starts launching knees. I was like, yes, these are awesome. I love knees. Knees from the tie clinch. Like, I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> and uh, she just kept doing it over and over again. And and Young just really struggled there and couldn't find a way out. And then uh, then Chasson decides to uh, take the fight to the ground. You know, she showed off some tons, tons and tons of control there, land a little bit of ground and pound. And, uh, yeah, it was just a really, really strong win for someone who showed up on five days' notice and was super game. So good I, for Chess on here. I completely expected Chess on to just manhandle Young, probably even get a first round finish. But all the credit to Young, even though she's a natural flyweight, even though she took the fight on five days' notice, she went out and she took it right at Chess on to begin with, you know, throwing those kicks. She, it looked like she buckled Chess on early and. I was thinking, damn, she she might have an opportunity for an upset. It 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 didn't happen, but you know what? I I, be, I became sold on Young. She she's game. She's tough. Uh, even though Chiasun is so much bigger than her, it's it's not even funny how much bigger Chiasun is. But she was there till the end. She was trying, even though she was completely exhausted. And given how much notice she had for this fight. I think she had every every reason to be exhausted. It's not like she got to uh, uh, prepare for the altitude the way that many of these other fighters did as well, you know, because that's something that's easy to forget about. Young went out there, took a short notice fight in altitude. So she lost, but in many ways, I feel like she almost came out looking more impressive in the loss because uh, Chiasun was expected to, to just kind of smother her. Yeah, um, it's, you know, when, when you take fights on short notice like that and you don't have time to prepare and it's not your natural weight class, if you do anything other than get completely ran through, it's it's going to make you look good. Yep. So credit to her. She showed tons of heart, um, didn't quit at all. She kept trying, but this was Chasson's night here. Oh, totally, totally. All right, so opening up the card, 
Rolion, um, Holion. How do you say his first? I don't. Piva. Holion's what I've heard. Holion. Holion okay. Piva. Holion Piva knocks out Mark De La Rosa in the second round. Um, man, just the Piva was just obviously the harder puncher here. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a great job at staying at the end of his punches without punching his way into the clinch or anything like that. And De La Rosa just couldn't get the fight to the ground and was forced to strike it out. And then, you know, come the second round, Piva lands his gigantic right hand behind the jab, floors uh, DLR, and then Piva pounces with the solo punch and the referee stepped in to prevent any further and unnecessary damage. Yeah. And tough break. It had been a fun fight up to that point, too. Um, even though I feel like Piva was clearly winning, it's not like De La Rosa was completely out of it. He uh, had a couple of nice moments where he landed some counter shots on uh, on the lengthier fighter. But, yeah, I mean, that was the type of performance that I figured Piva was capable of because he's had a rough break coming into the UFC. Um took a split loss to uh, – who did it – Kaikara France? No, yeah, it was Kaikara France that he lost to. And who's then, really good, by the way. Yeah, that was a great fight. I, I think I can't remember. I think I might have even thought that Paiva won that. And then he he had his face split open by uh, Rogerio Bontorin. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I he he's one of those that I've kind of silently been rooting for. Kind of like, come on, man, get it together. You get it together. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Um, his girlfriend died in a motorcycle accident shortly after he was signed by, by the UFC. Yikes. That so he tough. just, yeah, he gets his UFC contract and then the world kind of falls on top of him. And then, you know, he puts together this performance. Happy to see it. Um, guy's got a lot of potential, I think for, for flyweight. So, yeah, he'll definitely get him, uh, someone ranked higher. You know, he came in 14. De La Rosa was 13. So this sets him up with, uh, I don't know. Maybe Asker Askarov. He's coming off a win. I don't know. Uh, would he jump that high? I have. I don't know. <laughs> There's so well, There's a lot of bodies. A lot of guys are coming off of people. losses, and he's already fought Kai Kara friends and Bontarin. So it's they like need to sign some people. I I don't know. Like is, is Shorty Torres still out there or <laughs> he's Dustin in Brave Ortiz? Now. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't even know what happened to Dustin Ortiz. What they need to do is maybe they should just allow knee, allow knees to the head of a grounded opponent for flyweight. <laughs> yeah, people will tune in, right? Like make oh, it absolutely. more violent. Allow soccer kicks, twelve to six elbows, and and knees on the ground at at one hundred and twenty five pounds. <laughs> I yeah, think just, we just, just solved them, it. you know. We they, just they, solved the flyweight problem. Yeah, because they, they don't have nearly as much mass, so it's not going to be as devastating. Let, let's do it. I like it. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the top here. Jan Blahovich knocking out Corey Anderson in spectacular fashion, three minutes and eight seconds into the first round, earning himself a performance bonus and possibly a shot at John Jones's UFC light heavyweight title. <laughs> Mm. Definitely, this card needed this to happen. Um, the odds makers had this fight ending early, and uh, I think Anderson was the one they were favoring over Jan to get it done. But Anderson just wasn't forcing the issue with the takedown. Tried to box it out and got slept for it. Yeah, yeah. Anderson, I believe, was about a. He was roughly a two to one favorite. So. Uh, once again, Blahovich is uh, spoiling uh, the UFC's plans. Yeah, or or helping them do their jobs so they don't have to match make. Since it seems <laughs> like John Jones is on board, he was present, and uh, Jan definitely wants it. And with uh, you know, MMA fans have short memories, so they're going to remember this and be like, "Oh yeah, let him do that." Who's Dominic yep. Reyes? So yeah, that's true. We do have a bad habit of that. So they'll probably line that up. Happy and to I'm see it. I'm fine though. with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes the division more fun for me. Totally. Uh, Diego Sanchez <laughs> picking up a disqualification. Ah. Reha due to an illegal knee on the ground. Uh, also, Brock Weaver picking up a disqualification <laughs> win due to an illegal knee on the ground. Montana De La Rosa picking up a strong unanimous decision over Mero Romero Barella. 
And all in all, just, you know, a lot of meaningless fights with not much consequence in terms of title contention or anything like that. Um, not like a ton of crazy finishes, but at least the headliner, you know, came came through. And yeah, maybe we'll good. open up the debate about illegal knees on the ground, <laughs> at least, hopefully, at least like a maybe a little conversation about it. But you got any final thoughts on this card before we get out of here? Um, main event was the only one that had any real consequence and it completely delivered. Otherwise, uh, the event's largely going to be, uh, forgettable sands for the double disqualifications. Absolutely. All right. Well, that does it for us. Thank you guys for tuning in. You can find me on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. You can find Dane on Twitter at the Dane Fox. Zane Simon should be back next week. If he successfully narfles the Garthok. Uh, Until then, go be good people.